Okay, enough of that. Let's, let's jump into this. So our series is called Life Hacks. We're actually wrapping it up, and uh, we'll go into a new series here pretty, uh, pretty quickly. This idea on life hacks is simply this. This is what a life hack is. A life hack is a shortcut, a skill or a skill set, a method, a methodology that increases productivity and efficiency in all walks of life. A shortcut, a skill, or a method that increases productivity and efficiency in all walks of life. And so I've talked for the last several weeks about how good it is to become better at what we're doing in life so that we're getting more fruit out of it and we're enjoying it and it's, it's just flowing the right way. But the question might be asked, so pastor, you know, it's sort of a self-help idea. That's great, but does self-help stuff belong in church or is that better for a Tony Robbins uh, you know, conference that we could go to? I, I think the answer to that would be found in this, uh, this idea of a life hack. If the life hack deals with a spiritual issue, then it belongs in church. And if it just deals with how to be a better person, then maybe not. Maybe, maybe that's an arguable point. Maybe that can be done some other place, some other time, maybe a Wednesday night. But um, what, what from the pulpit we're trying to do is to teach the Word of God. And so self-help's a good thing. But, you know, the Bible doesn't teach a lot about self-help. The Bible makes this statement that you really can't help yourself, and that's why you need a Savior, right? So when, when churches get into that self-help thing, trying to help people get better and try harder, what a mistake that can be. And I understand it's good, but it's not salvation. All right, so the life hat today. Just, I'm going to say it, but let me prep you. Don't go, uh, eh, not for me. Uh, I'm not in that place. Or, uh, you know, here, here's the life hack. Let me just do this. Here's the life, here's the title. Uh, help, I'm a parent. <laughs> help, I'm a parent. Like You're like, I, that, see, that's not me. I'm not a parent. Uh, I don't want to be a parent. If I listen to this, am I going to be a parent? Don't, you don't, don't, don't do that. I think that every message that we write, these two things are true. First, we are pursuing the Holy Spirit's heart on it. So if the Holy Spirit puts it in us to teach it, then it's got to have something for the entire church, right? But I do think it's a specific for a bigger demographic that's inside of our church. So maybe you're sitting there thinking, been there, done that, or I've never gone there and I don't want to go there. So don't don't prejudge it by the title. Sit and listen, because I think that you'll find some things in this that are... um, that are still nourishing to you and encouraging to you and can help build your relationship uh, with God. But we are talking a particular thing, and so let me, let me dive in. John 1.17 will be the scripture that I begin with. Uh, John 1.17 is these two things uh, together. It's the, it's the most clear one scripture teaching on what the Old Testament covenant was and what the New Testament covenant is through Jesus. And John 1.17 reads this way. For the law was given through who? Moses. But grace and truth came through who? Jesus Christ. So there is not a more clear, concise, perfect understanding of the Old Testament covenant that it came through the law with Moses. And the law was this. If you do this, I'll do this. If you are disobedient to this, This is going to happen to you. And then Jesus through the new covenant is this. I did it all for you. So if you just come in by faith to what I've done for you, you can receive this new life and I'll continue to work in you to will and to do for my good pleasure. The new covenant is based on much better promises. It's a powerful thing. So this understanding of John 1 and 17 of what Moses brought in and then what Jesus brought in, it's great theologically to understand Old Testament New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. But it's also one of the best parenting scriptures ever written. It's a powerful parenting scripture. And I was studying it one day, and I saw it. It was just like God hit me with, look at the truth of this thing. So read it through this lens right here. When you're parenting children, depending on what age they are, at some point when they are young, you need to be Moses. You need to give the law. You need to tell them this is right, this is wrong, this is true, this is a lie. You're not going to be able to do this and be blessed. If you do this, you will be blessed. Teach the difference from right and wrong. And if you're one of those parents who's bought into the philosophy today of really have a hands-off approach, let your child develop, let them decide for yourself, you've bought a lie for this reason. What you're abdicating 
the world is not abdicating. What you're not speaking to, people in school systems are speaking to it. People in media are speaking to it. So if you decide not to put your morals and your values in your child so that they grow up sort of like uh, untainted and then they become 21, they can make up their mind. I want to assure you, for the last 21 years, you've kept your mouth shut while the enemy has whispered to them every day. So someone's going to put their values in your child. Let it be you. Put your values in your child. Don't abdicate that position. Don't buy that lie. Don't think you're harming your child. Listen, uh, that idea of like, I I just want to kind of step back and let them bloom. They will bloom, but you're not going to like what they bloom into. You're going to be disappointed with it. You're going to say, what happened? And I, I can tell you what happened. You let the world put its philosophy in them, and after 21 years, you begin to get fruit. You get it a lot earlier than that. But at 21, it gets kind of locked in there, and then it becomes difficult to, to reverse things. Um, so this whole, I am Moses, uh, that's the first fill in the blank. I am Moses. Moses gave the law. Remember in that scripture, John 1, 17, the law was given through Moses. Um, when I say you're the lawgiver, what do I mean by that? The law is not, um, the law is not bad. The law is not a negative. The law is not um, some harsh and heavy thing. Uh, the law is what allows people to function in society in a healthy way. If we don't have laws, people do what they want, when they want, how they want. That's chaos. So don't see the law as some negative, horrible thing. Of course, laws can be abused, but the law in and of itself is a good thing. It allows us to function well. So when I say you're Moses, you're the lawgiver, when you have a child, your child is not born like perfect. Contrary to to what you believe, Like everybody else's child is messed up, but mine is perfect. It's just, here's how we know the children are born messed up. Put a toy in the hand of a two-year-old and watch what they'll do with the toy. They'll beat people with it. They won't share it with somebody else. They're selfish. They'll cry and manipulate you if you tell them you need to put it away and take a nap. We, We look at that and we think, you know, well, what is that? It's called a sin nature. And that thing will become worse and worse as they grow older. If you do not begin to teach this is right and this is wrong. So when I say that you're Moses, they're little. They're, they're, they're unformed. Your job is to begin teaching them the difference between right and wrong. You're teaching vowels. You're teaching uh, um, morals. You're teaching uh, what you believe to be true. You're not just doing it based on your emotions. You're doing it based on the principles that you live your life by. Okay? That's what we mean by teaching the law. And I think the most uh, important thing, there's a scripture from Proverbs that is probably the most important scripture that's been used over and over again with parents on the importance of raising children. But listen to this before I read it to you. It's really important that you understand this. Um, It's a really great scripture. But for most parents, there's a, like a, um, a hurt of when you read this scripture that, well, I'll just read it to you and then I'll, we'll go. Okay. It's Proverbs 22, six. You've probably heard it. Um, this is the translation that's really good and really correct. Let me tell you the one that you grew up with and have heard before. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from that. Let me say it one more time. Train up a child the way they should go, and when they're old, they're not depart from that. Okay, that sounds really wonderful, and when we tell young parents, train them up the right way so when they're older, uh, they'll do the right thing. Man, that sounds so good, but I'm just going to tell you right now. Here's what I have found to be true. You can do all the right things. You can love Jesus. You can demonstrate it in front of your children. And it's no guarantee that your children will love the God that you love. There's just, it doesn't work that way. And then the condemnation that that causes on a parent is this, that you read that scripture, uh, train up a child in the way they should go when they're old, they're not depart from it. Here's what you're left with. If you're a parent who tried your best and you loved Jesus, but your child simply does not, they went a different way. You're forced with, with one of, of these two things generally. One, the scripture doesn't work, or two, you were a bad parent. 
Can I give you a third one that's not the scripture is not true and that's not you're a bad parent? Here's the third one. What if it was a bad translation from the Hebrew into English that is 90% correct, but because they didn't have the right quite vernacular, it leads us to believe the idea of if you do the right thing, they'll do the right thing. The bottom line is this. Every person, including you, have been given the great gift of free choice. And just because you know what's right and wrong doesn't mean you always do the right thing. Do you agree with that statement? Even the people in this room who know the difference between right and wrong doesn't mean we always do the right thing. We all have our choices that we make. So here is a better translation of that scripture. Uh, This is from the Good News Version, and it's just a literal from Hebrew into English, and it would read this way. Teach children how they should live, and they will remember it all the days of their life. So in other words, teach them the difference between right and wrong, and when they become adults, at least they'll know the difference between right and wrong. They may not do it, but they will understand if they go the opposite direction, this is wrong. I keep hearing this terminology a lot. We live in a post Christian nation. What does that mean? That we are past the simple understanding of biblical values that people were raised with a two or three generations behind us. How do we correct that? All we need to do to correct it is have the people who love God today teach their children correct values. And we are no longer a post-Christian generation. Thank you for that big amen right there. So what does it mean to give the law? You're Moses. Uh, I think these two things are really important. When Moses gave the law in the book of Deuteronomy, I'll read it to you. This is Deuteronomy 28, uh, verses 1 and 2. Now, it's a lot longer scripture, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. This sums it up. When Moses gives the law to Israel, he begins by saying this. If you fully obey, I'm going to start again. I want you to pick out the the most important word. It's the fourth word. starts with an O. (laughs) If you fully obey, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I am giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. Look at this next part. And you will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. So when you give the law, here's what it means. Teach the difference between right and wrong, but encourage your children that if they'll obey and serve Jesus There's a blessing in it for them. But then also, don't fail to teach this part. Because at the end of Moses' teaching on being obedient, in verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28, he says this to Israel. But if you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all the commandments and the decrees that I'm giving you today, all of these curses will come and overwhelm you. Now, I'm not telling you to tell your child you'll be cursed, but you do need to tell them that you will not be blessed if you walk in the opposite way that God has for you in life. Do you know that the book of Proverbs says that the way of the transgressor is hard? Tell them that. Don't let them crash into the wall and then say, wow, that hurt. Tell them before they crash that if you keep going that way, it is going to be hurtful to you. You're not going to be blessed if you do these things. The greatest failure that we make as parents is that when we don't teach our children, especially when they're young, the difference between right and wrong, and then encourage them. If you do what God wants you to do, you'll be blessed. But if you don't, you're going to struggle. And I don't want you to struggle, and God doesn't want you to struggle. So be obedient to what God tells you to do. Walk in the place that God wants you to walk. Does that make sense? And if you're like, I don't know if I agree with that. Are you a believer? Seriously. This is the most fundamental lordship issue. He's the Lord. He gets to direct what we do. We should be telling our children, walk in this way. This is how you're blessed. This is how God does it in your life. So I am Moses. All right. How long are you Moses? Are you Moses when they're 25? If you try to be Moses when they're 25, your children will never come around you. Now, if that's your goal, I just gave you a secret of how you 
Yeah. If you're like, ha ha. Uh, <clears throat> but if you are like, I want to have that relationship with my kid. L- listen, this is an important thing I'm about to teach you right here. When they're little, um, just like, just like in, in creation, God spoke into the darkness and created the light. He took what was without form. The Bible uses the word void. It's not, it's not yet um, uh, in its place, in its destiny. It's not yet doing what it's created to do. What your job is as a parent is to take that child before they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're, they're not in that place yet where they understand their purpose. Your job is to begin speaking into what is void and what is dark and calling out the light. This is who you are. This is why you're here. This is what it's all about. And by the way, if you abdicate that, what do you think the world is telling your children about their reason for existence? They're telling them that it's accidental, that it's biological, that there's no real purpose for it. Yes or no? No, so they're not saying it in a mean, ugly way. But what is taught is that it just simply happened in a random big bang. While I do believe there was a big bang at one point, I don't think it was random. I don't think it happened accidental. I think that God called, let there be light, boom. They just pick it up from the boom. I'm a (laughs) pre-boomer. That was good. (laughs) Write that down. That's a pre-boomer. So you're Moses, but for how long? So while they're little, and while you're forming the difference between right and wrong, you're Moses. But you make a classical mistake that parents can make if you try to be only Moses to them for the rest of their life. Because that scripture read this, that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So as they get into adolescence, and they get into older, past adolescence, they become young adults, no longer are you the lawgiver? Now you have to learn to teach them how to understand grace, mercy, and truth. And here's the most important thing that you're really teaching them. You're teaching them how to hear from the Holy Spirit themselves. When they're little, you're the voice that they hear. But when they're bigger, if you don't transition, then you're going to have to chase them around for the rest of their lives and be the voice that tells them what's right and what's wrong. How fun is that? Not much for them or you. You want to teach them to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Do you get what I'm saying? So so there's this, like, if you drive, those of you who drive a car, you've got um, got a brake, and you have an accelerator, and you have to learn, follow this, it's just an easy illustration. You have to learn the balance between the two things to go anyplace. If all you do is press the brake, right? Okay, that's safe, but you don't go anyplace. Don't, 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 no, don't, don't, don't. You'll produce fear. They won't crash, but they don't go anywhere. But if all you do is press the gas all the time, you're going, but, well, not only who knows where, but you're not going to keep going for long. You're going to run into something really hard. So to drive well is a combination of, listen to me, of law and grace. And teaching them how to know when to apply both is how you move forward. All right, here's a better. It's the difference between a right wing and a left wing. Which wing is the best one to have on an airplane? Yes. 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 Well, I like the right, left, both. You need both. To get anywhere, you've got to have both. Okay, so that transition from Moses then to Jesus when, when you're becoming more Jesus, you're teaching grace and truth. Jesus had this incredible ability. Listen to this. How do you teach the difference? How do you teach them to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit? All right. Jesus had this incredible ability that he could separate really quickly the behavior of a person from who the person really is. The woman caught in adultery. Do you remember the story? They catch her. They bring her in. All the, the legal uh, religious people have big stones in their hands. And they, hey, Jesus, in the law, this is what they say, in the law, Moses said to stone her. That's true. That is true. What do you say? 
And Jesus bends down and begins to write. We don't know what he wrote, but something that got their attention. And then he just looks at me and he says, okay, um, the first one of you who doesn't have any sin can throw the first stone. Yoikes. And so it says that the oldest first drop their rocks to the youngest. And finally, one by one, they all walk away so that the only two left in the situation is the woman and Jesus. And then Jesus, he waits until this happens. And then he looks at the woman and he says, woman, where are your accusers? She said, sir, I see none. Listen to these powerful words. Neither do I accuse you. However, leave this life of sin. So he, he had an ability to separate behavior from the person. He could give the person back their dignity without approving of the behavior that was wrong. One of the greatest things you can learn to do in life for any person, if you're married, learn to do this. If you have children, learn to do this. If you work with people, learn to do this. If you have any interaction with people whatsoever, right? Learn to do this. Separate the person and the value of the person from what the person is doing at the particular time. When we tie what a person does to who they are, we're, we're tying them to something for the rest of their life and not giving them a chance to change. And you know what you needed more than anything? You needed God to give you a chance to change too. And you still need God to give you a chance to change, don't you? Aren't you glad that God, every day, aren't you glad that God doesn't come in and go, that's it. You had five chances and you used them all. Sorry, there's just no more hope. For, yeah, by 8 a.m. So what does that make you? Out of luck. S -s Jesus had that fantastic way to separate the person from the behavior. He, he, could, he could restore the worth and the value and the dignity of a person. And yet, he knew how to say, look, leave this thing behind because this is, this is not who you really are. You're so much more than this. Wow. When you're a parent, learning to separate the person from the behavior is so, so important. Oh, it's one of these ones where I got into some things last night with some examples. And, you know, Amy read to me a bunch of emails that came in just from last night on people who were like, so thankful, Pastor, for you being willing to share. It helped me in my situation. But I always feel so, we feel so vulnerable when we share personal things from our family. Now, I check with my kids and ask, is it okay? But I'm always just like, so this idea of separating the, the behavior from the children, um, you, you know, just because we're pastors and because we stand up here and we teach these things and we believe these things does not exempt us from having to go through these things with our own children. Yep. Yep. At each level, man, with, with trying to do the right thing and believing things, Fully, everything that we're telling them that this is right and this is wrong and this is blessed and this is cursed, we still would find our children being pulled by a world like a magnet. And sometimes their identity wasn't in the things in this church. It was out there in their schools. Anybody know what I'm talking about right now? Can, so that identity would pull on them and try to... So, so, I mean, man, we had to constantly separate behavior from the person. One of the things that we really got good at doing was just to simply tell them, this is not who you are. And you know, the, the weirdest thing was they would look at us and tell them, this is exactly who I am. Uh -huh. Oh man, <laughs> dude, I totally wanted to let them go. But you know what? Yeah. Uh, you know what? Moses does say I can stone you. <laughs> um, it is to, to remind them over and over, this is not who you are. Are when they're in your face telling you this is exactly who I am and this is exactly what I'm going to do. Just you have to, that's when you have to stand by faith. So it goes a little bit different right now in that, um, you know, like um, it, it was different with each one, but the twins, our last ones, man, they just, oh, they tried us out over and over and over again and just, you know, I, I mean, you look at them now and you think, wow. So by the way, so let me tell you what, why do I think I have any authority to stand up here and teach this? Well, one, because it's true. That's always the case. But two, I don't think we have perfect kids, and I don't think we're the best um, parents in the world. Here's what I do think gives us some right to teach on this. We have five that we've raised. All of them now are adults, and all five of them love Jesus with all of their hearts. So now, some of them are still trying to figure out 
jobs and careers, and we have a special needs who's still living with us, and there's things there that we, we need to see change, and we're dealing with, you know, all sorts of things that everybody deals with, but the bottom line is that our cho- we did something right. Yep. Yeah. That I know, we did something right. And so that's, that's where I'm trying to come from when I teach this. Not arrogant, not haughty, not, hey, look at me. Just, I'm, I'm trying to teach on something and then be real about it. So with the twins, man, they, they played athletics constantly. They played three sport athletics. They were, they, they were out there more than they were here. That's the truth. And we tried to reinforce them being here, but it was always a constant push me, pull me, and just, you know. I remember we were at dinner one time with the Ewings. Tom comes and plays guitar for us. You know who I'm talking about? It's Chris and I. Are, we're over at the mall eating with the Ewings. And the boys uh, in high school, had pl- they had been invited to go to this party, and it was a drinking party, and they knew what our standards were. And yet I also was practical, and I just said this to them. I do not want you to do this for a number of reasons. One is, you're not old enough to be doing this. But if you do this, here's what I need from you. Don't you ever get behind the wheel of a car and drive if you drink. Amen. And here's the deal I will make with you. If you find yourself drinking... And you, I don't want you to do it, but if you do it, do not get behind the wheel. Call me, I will come get you, and I'll make this promise. In that moment, I will drive you home, and we will not talk about it. Tomorrow morning, I get the right to be father again. (laughs) But that night, I will suspend it. Because I do not want you behind the wheel of a car because you're trying to get away with something. Now, you might think, Pastor, don't you think that's a little liberal? Maybe it'll save the life of your kid. Just maybe. Maybe you'll listen to me right now and you won't think religious, religious, Moses, Moses, Moses. Maybe you'll begin to realize that how do you apply grace and mercy when a person is struggling with something? And we all struggle with things. And so one time they have this conspiracy and the the two of them did this really ugly thing. They conspired together to call from different places at different times to let us know they were going to be in these two different places. But in reality, what they were doing was trying to buy time to get to this party. And so we're out at dinner, and they made a a treacherous, bad mistake. Instead of asking for their father, who would have just gone, you're going to be where? Okay, be safe, and I'll see you later. They asked for their mother. (laughs) And so the first one calls and says, hey, I'm going to so-and-so's house. Is it okay if I spend the night? Uh, Where are you going to be at? What are you doing? Uh, Spend the night. Okay. And then like five minutes later, the other one calls. They weren't great tacticians. The other one calls and asks for the mother and says, hey, I'm going to go to so-and-so's house, another. And is it okay if I spend the night? And the father would have just gone like, yes, uh, I want you home in the morning at X time. But the mother listens to it and the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Scott is my witness. We are eating dinner. She hangs up the phone. She looks at me in front of the Ewings, and this is what she says. We have to go now. (laughs) Right now? So now, and I looked at the Ewings, I said, we have to go now. (laughs) So out the door we go, and I'm like, where are we going? She said, the boys are up to something. I know it, and this is not the typical up to something. Something is wrong, John. Something's going to go wrong. This is the Holy Spirit helping you raise your children. Listen to that voice. Listen to that voice. So we go out to find them, and we're searching all over the place for them. Long story short, um, I gave up, and I'm just like, I'm, we're not going to find them. Let's go home. And Chris is like, I am not going home, and she found them. And where and how she found them were exactly, exactly what the Holy Spirit just, boom. And it was, it was one of those times to where, <laughs> you know, The disappointment and the discouragement, and I, f- I would struggle as a pastor. I had to get up and say, "Hey, here's the standard we're trying to live," while well, knowing that we're struck. But I know that's not who my children are. I just know that their behavior right now. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so I just have to. I had to fight that battle. That this is not who you really are, but I can't ignore what you're doing either. And in this situation, this is what the, not the normal thing 
This was something that the Holy Spirit was warning my wife, if you let this go. See, here's what I really think. I think they were right at one of those junctions in life where they could have turned left or they could have turned right. It would have been to most people just another day, but I think that left turn could have brought them someplace today where maybe they're not serving the Lord at all. And I think the Lord gave us something to stand up right now and intercede for your children and let them know you have to be a little more Moses at this moment, not just Jesus at this moment. And I'm trying to protect them and how I tell the story and in what we did. But you just have to constantly learn that balance between the two things. You can be all Moses, but here's what I know about the law. If you put people under the law, when they're old enough to get away from the law, all of us do this, by the way, we'll cast the law off of our back and run the other way, and then we'll tie everything that has to do with God to the law. And that's why so many people will walk away when they become adults from Christianity because they were taught the law and not grace. But you can't just teach grace because grace in and of itself is, there's truth also. So inside church, it's not anything goes anytime, anyway. Katie, my daughter, said it this way at the teaching team this week, and I thought this was brilliant. Say what you mean, mean what you say, but don't say it mean. That's good. Say what you mean, mean what you say, but don't say it mean. Learn the balance between truth and grace. Okay, so let me do these things because I'll run out of time real quick here. Uh, let me give you four, four quick things about parenting that we've learned that um, I would just tell you if you could learn to master these things uh, or work on these things or be good at these things, you'll find that this is a life hack, a shortcut, a skill set, a methodology that increases productivity and efficiency in this area of life. So here, number one, parenting never ends, but it changes. Parenting never ends, but it changes. If you decide to have a child, here's what you've really decided, that for the rest of your life, your heart will walk outside of your body. And that's scary, and that's frightening, but it's also thrilling, and it's wonderful, and it's worth it. But the problem with your heart being outside of your body is that your heart can go and do stuff that you have no control over. Here's, listen to what I've learned. Far easier to be the parent of a little child than to be the parent of an adult child. Because when they're little, you can at least grab them and stop them. You can solve most of their problems in 30 minutes like a sitcom. But when they're adults, few things get solved in 30 minutes, and the problem is you can't stop them. You have to stand there and watch it. And that's hard to do. Man, that's hard to do. <sighs> Parenting never ends, but it changes. If you go to church here for any length of time, you know that I had a close call with a heart attack about three years ago. Here's a side of the story you never heard. Uh, when it happened, it was without warning, super scary. Uh, I didn't jump in an ambulance. Chris drove me to the hospital from our Lakewood campus all the way to Littleton Hospital. So 20-minute drive while I'm having a heart attack. But I didn't know it was a heart attack. Uh, at one minute, I'm trying to clear my throat. It felt like I couldn't clear my throat and swallow. At other times, my hands were numb and my jaw hurt, my back hurt. Of course, if, if, if you're prepared for the, the signs, then you recognize it. But if you've never studied the signs, you have no idea what it is. I'm just thinking it was something that I ate and I just can't swallow. I can't, and then it would hurt really, really bad. So I'm in the car and I'm panicking. Oh, ow! She is like a rock, man. She's like, John, just breathe. John, it's going to be okay. I'm going to get you there. She's a rock. I would begin to panic. I think I'm going to die. You're not going to die. It's going to be all right. We're going to get there. Hey, it's okay. She just, while I'm in this, I'm having a heart attack. My wife's driving with her left hand, and she reaches over with her right hand and lays it on my heart and begins to pray over me. What a woman, man. What a woman. I'm just like, okay, whew. So we pull up at the hospital, and, you know, um, what's wrong, sir? My chest. You cannot believe how fast. They really can move fast yeah. if it's the right thing. And in moments, I'm in the back, and, man, they strip you, and they hook you up to all these leads, and they have an iPad that they're able to tell through the leads what's going on. So I'm telling the doctor, do you have any industrial strength Maalox? This is how I'm going to cure myself, industrial strength Maalox. And he goes, John, you're having a heart attack right now. 
And I can't tell you what I said right now. <laughs> Catch me one-on-one -on -one and I'll let you know what I said. But I was just shocked by that. And my wife is just, she's a rock. It's going to be okay. The kids start getting there. She's just telling each one of them, the enemy's not going to have your father. Everything's all right. I don't want you to panic him. Calm down. We're going to pray. She's just this rock of Gibraltar. And then the weirdest thing happens. Her mom and dad get there. And her dad walks into the room, and my wife turns and sees her father and begins to just, she throws herself at her dad into his arms, collapses, and begins to weep. I don't want to lose John. What is that? No matter how old you are, if you still have your mom and dad, they still have that place in your life. So parenting never ends, but it changes. So what's really funny is that with my mom now, gosh, the one who used to give me my allowance and would help me and show me how to get dressed, and now I do those things for my mom. I help her with her money. I'll take her shopping. I'll make sure she's eating the right things. I'm going to take her on a trip to New Orleans here in a little while because she wants to show me the places that she grew up. I, for, it used to be I'd want to take her and show her all of my accomplishments. Now my mom has this great need to show me, and so it's my pleasure just to go and look at what she wants to show me. The roles have changed. It's really funny. You're always a parent, but the season changes. Um, at the risk of being judged and misunderstood, I'm going to tell you a story. I would prefer if you didn't judge me. But if you do, you do. Um, this thing about parenting never ending, but it changes. So when my kids did become of legal age, especially for my sons, it was a huge thing for them to have a beer with their father. Just a huge thing. Now, if you're like, what did you say? Near beer. We had a near beer, uh, if that helps you. Um, it was just a huge thing. When I'm with my friends, if I have a beer, I never, ever have to think, what do they think about this? In fact, with my friends, I've got a few friends in the church that give me this great gift. I don't have to be Pastor John. I can just be John. But when I have to wear the pastor hat, they can also see me as their pastor. It's a really cool thing. It's a really cool thing. It's a gift somebody gives you. Not everybody can do that. So when I'm with my friends, if I were to have a drink... It never occurs to me, hey, what do they think about this? Or are you messing them up? Are you causing them to stumble? If I perceive it would cause anybody to stumble, then I don't do it because I don't want to mess somebody up. But if I know it's all good, then it's just there's, there's peace with it, right? There's no, no big deal. I'm not talking about getting drunk, having a beer. But if I'm with my children and they want to have a beer, with every sip, I'm constantly thinking, what am I modeling to them right now? Maybe I should only drink half of this. I'm for sure not going to have a second one. Maybe I should have picked up 3-2 instead of 6-0. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't just do it at all. It's just this constant like, so what are you trying to say, Pastor? It's just, you're always a parent no matter how old they get. You always will worry. You're always concerned. If that causes you to trip and that causes you to stumble... I, I apologize. I'm not trying to advocate it. I'm just saying this is a story. I'm just trying to explain to you. When I'm with my friends, I don't feel that way. I can have this complete peace. But when I'm with my children, I'm just never not a parent. No matter how old they get, no matter what, I'm just always thinking, right? Got to do this the right way in front of them. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm saying? So, so we get these emails last night from some people who went home, who heard me say that last night and were like, wow. And then go home and had a situation with two kids at college that happened that night who wrote in last night and said, Pastor, we had no idea. You said that and it must have been for us. 
because we get home and we have this. And then I had three separate emails from people where something happened last night and they knew how to handle it because of what I said right here. So maybe you sit there and you want to judge me right now. Okay, I can't stop you. But what a terrible mistake you're making to not learn from something I'm trying to teach you right now. And can I just say this? Can you just let me be John? Like, I'm a good pastor who believes and lives with a very moral high standard, but can I also be a man and not have to act like some perfect thing that doesn't exist anyway? Can you let a pastor be a human? Some of you can, and some of you are not moving your jaws right now because you've already pre-decided I'm wrong about that. And I think that stinks for you. I do. Because I think it lets you... Well, let's move. Parenting has seasons, too. Parenting has seasons. Um, For those of you who like football, think about a football coach in season. One of the busiest, most overworked person in the world is a football coach during the football season. Man, they'll work 18 hours a day, don't they? And most of them will do it seven days a week. And Gary Kubiak, the reason he could no longer continue to be a head coach was because the strain of the work almost gave him a stroke. It's a hard job. But here's what's funny. When the season's over, then they go to Hawaii. Now they don't have to do anything. And so being a parent is very much like that. When they're little, it's in season, and you are working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, for what seems like eternity. But then that season ends, and all of a sudden, listen to this, I can go weeks without being called on, but when I am called on, Dad, I've got a crisis in my life. Can you be a husband right now? Yes, and I'm back in 18 hours a day. Dad, something's happened in my finances. Can you help? Yep, I'm back. Dad, I've got a grandkid that's sick and in the hospital. Can you be a pastor right now? Yep. And all of a sudden you go back into season. So I try to tell parents who are at that, like, here, I use this, this phrase, that the, the days are long, but the season actually is short. And so Daniel says to me, they've got two little ones right now, and the third one, and, and his little ones are busy. He's got a son that's just like him. It's no, it is the universal, what you sow is what you reap. He kept me up all night and now it's happening to him. He would give me no peace and now he has none. And whenever he says to me, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I act, oh, I'm so sorry. But I turn around and I'm like, yes, yes, there is a God. But he says to me, Dad, I just, you say it's like a a, a long day but a short season and it just doesn't feel like a short season and I just don't know how we're going to get through this. And I'm like, son, I know it feels like that. You just put one foot in front of the other and God's, his, his mercy and grace is new every morning. So just all you can do is do today and get up and do tomorrow. And believe it or not, the funniest thing's going to happen that all of a sudden that season's going to end And they'll leave your house, and then you're going to do the craziest thing that you can't imagine. You're going to wish you could go back and have that season one more time. It's the funniest. The moment they leave your house, this thing, this crazy thing happens where you were, you tried so long to get them out of there. And then they go, and you're like, where are you going? Come back. Or you can lose them. And then you'd give anything. You'd give anything. What would I say to a parent in the middle of that thing right there? God's grace every morning is new. And if you look too far down the road of how we're going to do this, you'll be overwhelmed and you'll be freaked out and it's hard to do it that way. Try to stay in the moment that you're in right there. There's grace, look at me, there's grace for the moment you're in right now. That's what you have grace for. You don't have grace for tomorrow. You don't have grace for next week. You have grace for right now. And if you learn to live in the moment that you're in right now, those moments added together create a season.
That's how you do it, John. And that's how you do everything in life, by the way. God gives you grace for the moment that you're in, not for next week or next month. Third one, older parents know, listen to this, not much is fatal. But they also know what is fatal. Older parents know not much is fatal. I think that the difference between being a new, younger father and a mature, older father was just being able to relax more, not feeling like this, this, is, this is final, this is fatal, this is going to kill them, this is going to take them in a place that we don't want them to go. The truth of the matter is, what you really want to be able to do is to place within them the Holy Spirit so that it's not you convicting them, the Holy Spirit convicts them. And then when you see them listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, you know you've done your job right. That's what you want. Ryan, that's what you want. Younger parents, number four. Younger parents know this is important. Raising children is important. But they also know that not everything is important. Because if everything is critical, nothing is critical. Do you get what I mean by that? What older parents forget is, yeah, they become relaxed, but they tend to forget how important it is. Younger parents tend to see everything as important and forget that not everything is fatal. In fact, you know, the, the commercial that's out there, the lady, the, she has her first baby, and she tries to sanitize everything and keep everything nice. And you did the same thing. Then you have the second and the third, and the binky drops on the ground. You pick it up, suck it, and put it in the baby's mouth <laughs> before you boiled everything. Now you just like, Psst. And then sometimes you don't even, you just look, there's no hair. Yeah. You know exactly what you do. I've got six minutes, and I'll have you out of here. Here's the last two things in my notes. What would I do different? Here's the one thing that I know that I know. If I could go back, I would do different. Um, many, many times as a younger father, I wasn't emotionally there. I worked a lot. I was a workaholic. I had a lot to prove. I had a lot of weight on my shoulders. I had a lot of responsibility. I took all of those things seriously. I did my job seriously. I gave myself to it. So I would come home and I would be tired and I fell into the rut of this is what Chris does. This is what I do. Those two things should kind of stay separate. So when I get home, I have the right to just kind of crash. She never got the break from being with five kids all day long. I regret that. I regret that when I came home, I would be so tired that I would see the kids as a nuisance and not as a blessing. So I would, I would hurry. My job was to put them to bed. I would read the story as fast as I could. I would pray the prayer in record time, kiss them on the forehead and get out of the room so I could go down and sit on the couch. So I was tired. Anybody? Thank you for being real with me right now. Man... Oh, if I could do that again, I'd savor those moments in the bedroom where I could talk to them for a few minutes. I'd be way more creative in my storytelling. I'd give Katie all the kisses that she wanted. Every night, and I know it was just so she could stay up. I, that was, I knew it. Let's do butterfly kisses. Let's do Eskimo kisses. And kiss me on my ear. Kiss me on my head. Okay, let me kiss you. And it just like, then she'd grab my neck and not let go. I'd be like, no! Oh! <laughs> and instead of just enjoying that, God, if I could go back and get those kisses again. And you can't get them again. They're gone. But if I could go back... And just be in that moment. Actually be in that moment. I would force myself to be in that moment. When I got to be an older father, I did learn how to do that better. I told some of the greatest stories ever. My version of Jack and the Beanstalks is killer. Yes. <laughs> My grandkids asked me to teach that story. But as a younger father, I, that's what I would do different. I would have been present the one thing that I would not change 
is learning how to let the Holy Spirit help you in your parenting. That, I think, is what helped us be successful parents. I'll just give you um, a quick example Uh, with the twins. Um, It's really easy when you have twins. Most of you won't experience this, but when you have twins... You know, you just, you, everything, you do them, the, you dress them the same. And when they start school, they're in the same class. And then when they start sports, they play the same sport. And it's, some of it's just because it's easy. You don't want to bring them to different places. But it also, um, if one of them enjoys being a twin, great. But if the other one is embarrassed by being a twin, not so good. Listen to my story. Daniel loved being a twin. He was proud of it. And David was his best friend, but David was embarrassed by being a twin. And I, when he was younger and little, no big deal, but as he got into adolescence and started getting older, it embarrassed him that he had a twin and it really bothered him that he didn't have his own identity. Because everything we did was shared identity because that was what was easiest for us. And I remember at some point, David got to this place where Man, his heart, like overnight, it seemed like his heart got really hard. And David, of all my kids, is probably most like me in that he'll hold everything on the inside and not tell you what he really, really feels. Tell you what you want to hear, but not what he really thinks. Just doesn't, takes a lot to get him to open up and tell you what's really going on. So I would ask him, son, is something wrong with you? What's going on inside of you? And nothing, nothing, nothing. But I knew something was wrong. And he would not tell me. And Chris and I, we just went. We were praying about it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to both of us and said, he's got to have his own identity. And I'm going to tell you exactly what you do. Do this and do not let the other kids have this. The other kids are going to tell you this is unfair. It doesn't matter. Do this for his sake. So we did that. It was amazing how I won his heart back. Uh, Let's fast forward, fast forward, 15 years, and he's 25. And I have the heart attack, and he's in Chicago. That's where he works at. And so he tells his boss, I've got to go back. My dad's had a heart attack, and he leaves, and he comes back to Colorado. And Dave's the one, he just doesn't show the emotions. He just doesn't, that's just not who he is. And after I'm home, and I'm in the bed recovering, um... You know, all the kids have come and checked on me and loved me and told me they're so glad. And we just, it was just this great time. Dave would be there, but he just wouldn't say anything. And the day he's supposed to go back to Chicago, he comes in the bedroom. And uh, he's standing there like he's a little kid. Kind of, and I know he wants to say something. <laughs> What's up? Uh, well... Maybe I shouldn't go back. Why not? Well, you see, I almost lost my best friend. Who? (laughs) You. I'm your best friend. And then he comes and gets in the bed with me. This big old boy lays his head on my chest to listen to my heart. And he starts crying. I don't remember the last time. He was six years old the last time he cried. And then I'm like, son, you got to get off of me. I'm going to have another heart attack. What the Holy Spirit helps you do in your parenting is to find those places where you have your kid's heart. So that when they do the stuff that's, you know, this doesn't prevent a person from making a bad choice or having to experience for themselves what you're trying to keep them from experience. But it keeps that relationship there so that regardless of what happens, there's a way back. So that boy laying on top of me just weeping. I'm like, son, go back to Chicago. I'm okay. I'm going to be okay. It wasn't long after that he moved back here just because he wanted to be by his family. Money can't buy that. All the stuff in the world, you can't, those are the things that this is what I'm trying to tell you. This man, this is why this belongs in church. 
the most important thing spiritually to me is my family, knowing that someday we will stand before the Lord, and I've got to make sure every one of them are there with me. I just can't afford to have one missing. Now they have the choice on their own. They may not, but they're going to have to go around me to do it. Do you get what I'm saying? They're going to have to go around me to do it. That's what we're fighting for. That's, that's what we're going after. Okay, I got to get you out of here. It's 1030 and there's plenty of time to make the transition. Now, normally on this weekend, we would have communion and I would lead it, but we felt what a wonderful opportunity to do something really cool and that's to take communion as families. So I, I want to just throw this out. If you're here as a single, then on the way out... At all the exits, you're going to see um, big boxes that have the communion elements inside of them. And then there's some instructions there. If you're not sure what you should say or what you should do to take communion, we've left some instructions. I'm sure that most of you will know how to do it. But take, take um, if you're a single, take one or two uh, for this week to just commune between you and the Lord. And if you're just a couple, take enough for you to do it as a couple. And if you're a family, take enough for you to do this as a family. And if you have grandchildren and you're blessed, take enough to do it with your grandchildren. I'll leave it up to you to how, take how many you want to take, right? But here's what I just think. I think that so often what we think is, uh, I got them to church, now pastor, do your job. And I'm just going to warn you on something real quick. Man, I applaud your effort to be here today. It shows much about who you are and how you've prioritized your spiritual life. But you still have to recognize that it's not my job to lead your family spiritually, to lead your marriage spiritually, or to lead you spiritually. I'm your teacher and your pastor. It's what you do in your private life, in your day-to-day -day life, that's going to have a much bigger impact than the hour and a half I have on a Sunday or a Saturday with you. Do you get that? So I want to share, pastor your own family. Be the prophet, priest, and king to your own family. And if you're like, oh, I'm afraid to do that, don't be afraid. Step into it. Move into this. Do this. Watch what God does with this. Father, we love you. We thank you. I bless you for the opportunity to teach this morning. God, I ask for your protection as people are leaving and driving. Folks, I plead the blood of Jesus over you. Please, 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 please take it easy getting out of the parking lot. Take it easy driving on the roads. I want you back next weekend. I bless the communion that you're going to share this week with yourself and with the Lord and with each other. And I thank you for listening to me. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.